Hey, welcome back to Learning to Program with Godot Game Engine. Uh, it's been a while since I made a video, so I thought I'd make a quick little video. Hopefully I can make this quick. Uh, this game I was playing with my daughter the other day. Uh, I'd made this a while back, and it's super addictive for some reason. Uh, all it is is a little block, and you just kind of dodge these other little blocks, and you try and get the highest score possible, and as soon as you hit one of these guys, it's game over. So. Uh, one thing I wanted to add is a reset button. Don't have that. So let's go ahead and get started on this guy. And we'll see how fast we can crank it out. So, new project. I'm going to call it Dodger 2 because I already made it once. And uh, it doesn't matter on this. I'm going to use this lower one just to show that it's quite possible. Alright, so we're going to make a 2D game. I'm going to go ahead and make my game uh, scene. So we're just going to have one scene here and I'm going to call it game and we'll go ahead and save it. We can save it right here, that's fine. Um, the one thing I do need to adjust to see my window viewport has got these default sizes so let's go ahead and change that. That's down here under project settings display window. So this is the kind of like native size of your screen so let's go ahead and change this to let's say 300 width. Uh, actually I want it to be taller than wide, so let's go 200 and 300. Then you can use this test width to kind of like blow it up and make it a little bit bigger. So let's uh, triple those. So we'll go 400, 600, and 900. My math foo is kind of weak today. One thing uh, we need to do is here in the stretch, <clears throat> we need to make sure we do viewport. Otherwise, uh, the the window will be large, but will our screen will still uh, be that little portion of it. And let's see, I think everything else is okay for now, so let's go ahead and close that. Save it and we can run it. I did miss one little thing, we'll go back and fix that real quick. So here we go, so this is be our full screen, that looks great. And um, right, the thing I missed was I want to make the background black. So it looks a little bit better for this, so that's under rendering environment and you've got this default clear color, black good to go. Alright, so here's our little game window. Um, let's go ahead and knock out some of the uh, user elements so we can go ahead and make a um, label for, oops, this is for the score and that can stay right up there at the top. We'll make another one for the game over. We'll call that game over label. And that one will move, oops, we'll move that to the center here and uh, change the text to game over. Don't need that new line. And uh, let's make it a little bit bigger. We can use the rectangle and just scale it. It'll look a little, look a little blocky, but uh, that's all right. And we can change the color. I think you can do that under material down here if you want to add a material. Uh, visibility, you can also modulate the visibility and you can finally, you can also change it by doing custom colors, font color and change it to red. So you got lots of options there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just do it under this visibility modulation. Should be fine. Um, yeah, good. Alright, so now we've got game over and we're just going to make that invisible because we don't want to see that. The score label, I forgot to put some text here, so score zero, get a little example so we see it. And great, so I'm also going to make a uh, just a node 2D that we can drop and I'm going to lock this so that it doesn't move around on me. And this is going to be my falling block target. So that's where I'm going to, or container I guess, is it, whoops. Another good name for it. Um, and so that's where I'm going to store all my falling blocks as they come down. I'm going to put them as children underneath that guy. Uh, <clears throat> and the, it, it's good for organization, but it's also good so I can clear all the children, all those blocks, easily when I go to reset the level. All right, so I'm going to need a script here. Might as well add it. Good to go. Um, Let's see, we also need, we're going to need a couple things here to catch, uh, so we're going to need some physics stuff here. So let's go ahead and make a Area2D, 
All right. And then underneath that, we're going to add a collision shape, 2D. And we'll change that to a rectangle. And he's up here. Let's go ahead and drag him down here. And widen him up. There we go. Now, it's a little funky because my area 2D is up here, but my collision shape's down here. In this case, it doesn't matter. Um, so we're not going to get too picky. But this is going to be my block catcher. And so the blocks will fall down. They'll hit this thing and we'll delete them. So this itself doesn't need a script. However, we do need to do a body entered signal. So we'll go ahead and add that. We've already added the game script, so we can add it there. And because we named it, it's going to carry that in this function and be super handy for us. All right, so then... Another thing I needed is, uh, well, let's go ahead and s make our player and our block. So we'll make a player. We're going to change this to a uh, kinematic, if I can spell it. There we go. So now it's a kinematic, and we're gonna just going to call this the player. And we'll go ahead and save it. There we go. And this needs a collision shape. go and it will be a rectangle perfect and remember we want uh, these guys to be up here at the origin because we can get funny stuff happening if we move uh, these things around so player has a collision shape this would work but we wouldn't be able to see it so uh, one other thing I want to change is I want to make this smaller this was from some testing earlier you have to do your own experimentation on uh, size of stuff, but I noticed that that was a little bit too big. So let's do uh, poly. Now the cool thing about this project is we're not going to use any outside graphics. We're going to do everything here within the engine. So I can make this by just clicking. Uh, if you click this plus sign up here, you can just click your nodes out like that. And you can make whatever shape you wanted, but in my case, I'm just doing a little rectangle. You can adjust them if you need to. There we go. Uh, but I want to change the color. We'll go ahead and make a nice little blue blue color. Looks good. So there's my player. And let's see. Looks good. Let's add a script because we're going to need one for moving them around. And then let's go ahead and add a scene for our falling blocks. So we'll call this falling block. And we'll change that type to a kinematic body as well and save it and we'll add a collision shape and it's another rectangle and like the other one I'm going to make it smaller as well oops alright so there it is and let's make a polygon so that we can draw it We'll do the plus sign, click out those corners. Doesn't have to be perfect, uh, since we're kind of blowing it up anyways, it won't be super visible, but you can always adjust it if you need to. Uh, you can also, if you want to get pixel perfect on it, what you can do is come over here to the polygon, go into data, the array here, and then you could just make these numbers exact. So I could do negative 5. This one will be negative 5. This one will be 5, negative 5. So I'm just looking at the number here and using the positive and negative of those. So now this is a uh, perfect square. And I could do the same to the player if I, if I wanted to. All right, so uh, let's drag one in and just see what it looks like. So I'm going to drag a falling block in. Looks great. I think that's the right size. Let's go ahead and animate this, so we'll make it move. So I didn't add a script there, I do need one. And here I'm going to uncomment the process function. And all we're going to do is do a move and slide. And vector, vector 2. We're not going to move any in the X position, but we do want to go down in the Y. And remember, Y starts at 0 and goes positive as it goes down. So I want to go down by, let's say, 100. We'll test that out and see how that looks. I believe I left one. Yep, looks pretty good. I like that speed. Um, we're, well, you could adjust the speed as the game goes on, but I'm going to leave it alone and just uh, adjust the difficulty by 
the number that comes along. All right, the player, we need, also need this function. And very similarly, uh, we're going to move use the move and slide, but we're going to do it conditionally based on if the left and right, right button are pressed. So we say if input dot, and I have is action pressed, or, or we could do is key pressed, and look specifically for the right key, or we could say is action pressed. Uh, actions give you a little bit more control, but specifically, um, this will even allow you to use your joystick. So I'm going to look at for the left, and you can check those by going up here to project settings, input map, and then find the uh, mapping. So here's left and right, and you can see I've got the key left. The left button is mapped to it, but also the left button on your joystick is mapped to it as well. And you can expand this. You can make your own and uh, by click type in the name and hit add. Uh, but we're just going to use these because they're already there in place. Do a move and slide and slide. And then uh, let's see, vector two. <clears throat> and I am going to use a variable for this one. Uh, I should use like a const there. Uh, let's see, speed equals, and we're, I think I played around with it before and 180 looked good. So let's do, uh, I don't think I need the bear when I do that. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is the player and he's going to move left and right. So I'm going to do that in the X position. And so I'm going to go speed comma zero because I don't want him to move at all in the Y position. However, left, uh, so the top left of this thing is zero zero so as I move right that's positive X and as I move left that's negative X so I want to go in here and say negative speed I'm going to do this exact same thing again but I'm going to do it for right and all I have to change is remove that negative sign so that it'll move in the positive X direction so now if I play whoop, I don't have a player Let's go back to the game scene and drag one in. So all I have to do is grab my player scene, move him to roughly the center, and start. So now I should be able to move left and right. My uh, player looks super janky because I didn't get those. See how it's kind of slightly? So let's go ahead and perfect those up. It'll be worth it. Uh, data polygon, negative 5, negative 5. 5, negative 5, 5, 5, negative 5, 5. Alright, so now it should be perfect and we shouldn't see that jankiness. There we go, much better. Um, Alright, what you also could do is you could make a scene for just this uh, polygon and then share it between your falling block and your player if you wanted to and then just modulate the color. Leave it white up here and then use the visibility modulate and you can do that. That way you can share it between it, save you a little bit of time. But this is fine and this allows us to change the shape if we wanted to. Alright, so one thing, a couple things to note. Um, if I go all the way, I can go clean off the screen. That's not good. Uh, it would collide with that, but it wouldn't cause anything to happen. They would just kind of stop. So first let's solve this problem of going off the screen. Now conveniently, because we used a kinematic body, all we need is a static body here to block us. So let's go ahead and add that. So I can do that by going to game, add a new thing, and let's do a collision shape. Nope, I need a static body. All right, so I need a static body, and uh, I could make this as a sub-scene. Let's do that. It'll be a little bit quicker. All right, so this change it into a static body, and we'll just call this a invisible wall, and then we'll add a collision shape, and we'll make it a rectangle. That's it. Uh, we don't need to be able to see this. We could, but we don't need to, and so we can just drag these in. So I'm going to select the thing there drag an invisible wall in, boom, and boom, there we go. Now let's see if our player can move outside of the screen. Nope, he gets blocked. Perfect. Alright, solve those two problems. 
So that's working out great. Uh, let's make the block be able to hit the player and trigger the game over. So first I'm going to add a game over function here so that I can kind of control it all from here. And we'll just we'll set the visibility on that game over label to equals true. That'll make it show up. And then let's see. We'll make another one. Uh, no, we'll just we will make a restart game, but we'll do that in a minute. Let's also do a uh, get tree dot pause equals true. This will lock the the game up, um, and that way our our blocks will stop falling. Uh, right. But we need to trigger this. So to trigger this, let's go to our falling block, uh, and we'll look at. I'm sorry. Go to our falling block. We'll go to our node, and we don't have a collision on body entered. So a quick way we can solve this. <clears throat> let's go to the player. He's got the same problem. This uh, kinematic bodies don't have a trigger for when they're entered. Now there is a code way you can handle this, but a simpler way to do it, just do it here in the engine is let's add a area 2D that'll get drug around with the player and we'll add another collision shape and we will make that a rectangle and we'll make it just a little bit bigger than the player so like like that if we made it too small what would happen is is the, the uh, collision would collide with the block and not move into this collision area that's why we need it just a little bit larger and so this is going to be my um, uh, hit or collide let's just call it hit hit area. So that's when I get hit. Um, right, so I need to trigger something on that. Now this guy, because he's an area 2D, does have a body entered. So we'll go ahead and fire that off, attach it to the player. So here's where I know that something came inside of the body of the player, or came to the player. So what I can do here is uh, I could just say print hit right now let's see what happens when this when this runs one I get one right away and then two I get one when I hit these walls now I should also get one when the thing falls on me so let's jump in his way boom I do get one there but I, like I said I also get these extra ones when I hit the walls I get one on the start the one on the start is you're actually hitting yourself I believe so this area is hitting this collision shape of the player um, so that's undesirable for us to, to, to you know, count that against the player. So what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to go to our falling block, and we need a way to identify that this is the block that hit us. So I need to make sure I select the kinematic body up here. I can go over to groups here and say um, crashable or hittable. We'll call it hittable, right? Probably not a word, <laughs> maybe, but... Uh, yeah, so now this guy is tagged as a hittable group, and you can see the little group icon there. Excellent. So now in my player script, I can look for that. So I can say if body is in group hittable, then let's print hit. All right. So now when I start this up, shouldn't get one on the start. I do get one when I hit the hit the block, and I don't get one when I hit the sides. Perfect. So we've solved that little problem. I love using groups for things like that. Um, they're very efficient. They're also, you know, very convenient and easy to easy to work with. So, all right. So we've got that working. Uh, let's make instead of having this one block fall, let's go ahead and and get a bunch spawn in. So for that, I'm going to use a timer. Timer, and we'll call it the spawn timer. And for that, let's look at the details. Um, Process mode is fine. Wait time. Let's leave it at one second to start. We do not want it to be a one shot because we want it to run over and over, and we do want it to auto start. All right, so there we go. Now what I do need to do is attach a signal on the timeout so that we can have some code run. So that'll put it right here in my main script. So what I want to do is I want to spawn out these falling blocks whenever uh, this timeout happens. Now, I need a reference to that. Now, I could just do a preload right here 
Uh, I can do a preload up here. I can put it in line. I could load it from the resource, but I want to, you know, do it fancy and be able to pick it. So I'm going to go out here to Godot's documentation. If you search for um, Godot exports, you'll find this page, and right here there's this one. It's called Packed Scene. So that's the one we want. There's all kinds of examples there of different things you can export. Um, but this one is this, and this is what we need. This is for picking a scene from your um, resources. So I'm going to do my following block scene, like that. And then we need to be able to spawn that out. So I can't do that from memory, so I'm going to pop out here to my handy dandy cheat sheet for Godot, and I've got one down here, load and instance scenes. So I'm going to grab all that, plop it in here. Now I have a line, let's shift that over, I do have this line for that preload, right? So I could have done that. We're not going to do that, so we'll delete that because we've already loaded our scene up here. So let's grab that, and here instead of scene to load, it's going to be this falling block scene. So I'm going to create an instance of it, that'll be this new node. Then I'm going to set the position, right? And this is just getting the current position of whatever this node was. So I'm going to delete that, I'm going to create a vector 2. And I'm going to, you know, put something in here. We'll fix that in a second. Right, so this would create a block and put it at 0, 0. Let's go ahead and put it at um, 100x and like 10y. <clears> that <throat> way no we can see this in action. And then I'm going to get the parent and add child. Now I don't want to just add it here to the root. I'd like to have this um, add to this falling block container. So it's real easy to do. All we have to do is instead of get parent, Let's go ahead and use the dollar sign notation and do falling block container. And then we'll do the add child and add that node there. So that should work just fine. Let's give this a shot and see. So, oh, we've got a error. This says uh, instance of nil. So I'm trying to call nothing here. I'm trying to call this instance method off it. And that's because I forgot to set this. So that's an easy fix. Let's go back to our 2D editor. Let's click on our game node where that script is, and you'll notice up here in the inspector we've got this new script variables section, and there's that falling block scene. Awesome. So what we can do is say load, pick my falling block, and then when we run, that's the, the node that will be added. So there we go. Oh, we got another one. Non-existent set position. So I need to update my uh, documentation that I've got here in my cheat sheet uh, to put... So I guess this has changed in uh, newer versions of Godot, and I forgot to update it. So let's go ahead and do that. There we go. So now we've got blocks, and they're adding right here at x100 and about 10 and the y, and they're just dropping right down like crazy. So let's add some variance to that. So we're going to need up here in the ready function, we're going to need uh, randomize just like that and then down here instead of just hard coding it at X we're gonna use a random range I think it is so let's see if I have that in my handy dandy cheat sheet I do right there it is so rand range and it gives you a from and a to and so I need a from and to uh, these blocks are five wide so I think I'd be okay putting it at 5, 2, and this goes to 200, so it would be 195. Let's try that. If it's not, we can fix it. So go from 5 to 195, and we're going to leave it dropping at 10 in the Y position. So let's save that, and we'll give it a shot. So there we go. So now our blocks are spawning at random positions, and we kind of got to dodge them. Our game is really shaping up. Now I can still hit it, and we don't do anything when we do that hit. So let's fix that real quick. So let's see. Um, right. Uh, so here's the block catcher, right? And we want this one to hit. So we want to just call the game over. So if we look in our main game scene, our player, let's move him up to like right there, 
So our player is a direct child of the game scene, of this game node. So all I need to do is on my player script, let's go get parent, so that should get my game script, and then let's call game over. Okay? So that'll call this game over right here, and it should pause and set that visibility. So let's try that. So if I get in the way, boom, game over, game pauses, and I see the game over message. Perfect. Now I want to add that restart real quick. Now if I've added, uh, the Godot has this awesome pause system, and it has, by default, you have inherit on all your nodes, and you can have stop, which means if the game's paused, this node stops functioning, and then you have process, which means if it's paused, it ignores this and keeps processing. Now if I set this at this level, all these children would inherit from it, and so my game wouldn't do really do any pausing at all. So what I need is to have a child object, so we'll call that the restarter. Um, and this can be anything, a uh, node is actually fine. I was searching in there, so restarter. So this is fine. Um, it doesn't need to have any 2D elements, so uh, a regular node instead of a node 2D is perfectly fine. I'm going to add a script to this, and uh, the big thing I need to do here is on this paused, I need to set this to process. So this keeps functioning even if the game pauses. So let's go ahead and look in this code. Um, I need to undo this guy, and what I want to do here is say input, oh wait, if input dot uh, is key pressed uh, and parentheses and I can use these can uh, definitions for R because I'm going to use the R key to restart then I want to restart the game so then I'll say uh, get parent dot restart uh, restart game Okay, now I need to go make this restart game function. So let's go back up to the game and we'll make another function right here called func restart game. Okay, and I'm basically going to do the reverse of this and a few other things. So I'm going to set the visibility of the game over to false. I'm going to unpause it. Uh, and I also want to, to unpause, I want to be last. I also want to delete all of the falling blocks. So to do that, I'm going to look in my handy dandy cheat thing again. Uh, let's see. So I have a delete node, and then here I have delete all children. So let's go ahead and grab that. So I'm going to delete all children, but I want to do it just on this falling block container. Um, right? So I'm going to say dollar sign falling block container dot get children. So I'm going to get all the children of that and delete them. So that'll be this falling block and any others that are added. Matter of fact, I don't need him anymore because I'm spawning them. Um, right, so I'm going to queue free those. So that'll get rid of all those children. And then I want to set the score back to zero. We're not keeping score yet, but we'll do that here in a second. Um, We'll have some more adjustments to make, but we'll go ahead and start with this. So let's see where we're at. We'll see what we need to do. So we've got blocks fallen. I don't increase the score, so let's go ahead and fix that. It does do that, and if I hit R to restart, things do restart and look great. So okay, let's go ahead and keep the score. So to keep score, um, we've got this block catcher. And what we want to do is add to the score whenever that happens. So there score equals zero. And then score plus equals one. So we're going to add a score whenever a block gets to the bottom. Uh, we're also not deleting those blocks. Wow, I can't believe I forgot to do that. So let's go ahead and delete those. So body dot Q free. So that'll delete the, bo the block that comes into the uh, block catcher increment the score. If we don't do this, as you notice, the game ran fine, but over time you get so many blocks uh, moving through here that it would slow the game down, and that would be undesirable. <clears throat> so, we've got our score goes up, but we need a way to see that. So we've got, already got our score label, but we need to update it. So let's go ahead and make another function to do this. Function, we'll call it update score label, and we'll say 
score label dot text equals score, and then we'll add string. We got to convert the score into a string so that we can add it to that that thing. And the reason I put this in a function is because I need to call this in a couple places. I want to call it here because we've just changed the score. Uh, I also want to call it in the restart game because I don't want to see um, the score. Or we need to reset the score to zero when we restart the game. All right, so let's see how that works. So I've got score zero. Let me dodge a couple. There's one, two, three, and I'll crash. Score shows stays on three, but when I hit R, it restarts to zero. Perfect. All right, so now um, let's see what else do we need. I think it's looking pretty good. Uh, oh. Let's make it speed up. So this will be kind of, I think, the last feature. Um, right, so we're right here, an easy way to do this, if you remember, our timer is set to one second wait time. So what we're, we need to do, what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, spawn timer dot wait time uh, equals, we could do minus equal, I guess, and let's set it to, you know, 0.05. We're going to shave off 0.5 seconds every time one of these ticks. So it'll kind of like logarithmic, logarithmically get faster. So you kind of see there at one second, I can kind of feel it getting a little faster, a little faster. Oh, now they're really coming. Woo! Yeah. But now it's, uh, it's probably going a little bit too crazy fast. So let's add a minimum there. So we'll say if, and we'll grab this. Whoops. We'll grab it, not delete it. So if that is greater than, uh, let's say, 0 0.1 seconds. So we'll make that our minimum amount. So we won't go below 0 0.1. So what it'll do is it'll keep chopping off from this one second until we get to 0 0.1, and then it'll stop chopping some off. So let's see how this plays. So if you wanted your max difficulty to be higher, what would you do? You would you would lower that minimum number so that even more could spawn at a faster rate. Um, as you can see, there it is. It's probably at the at the minimum there. We could print it, print it out so that we could see it, but I think that's pretty obvious that that's where it's going to stop. This feels pretty good. It's kind of fun, you know. Uh, it's addictively fun in an odd way, and I'm just dodging away, trying not to get hit by these blocks. I can't hit the uh, sides, and then when I hit game over, and I do have the R for restart, I can't hit, you know, go out of the side, so eventually I will get hit. Great. So one last little detail let's add is to our game over label. Let's go ahead and add a subchild, and we'll do another label, and uh, let's make this visible so that we can see it. And on this sub label, let's move it down here and say uh, press R. To restart. Now this is inheriting the scale from the parent so let's undo that basically. Uh, I could also just remove this from the game label but I want its visibility to change along with it. So let's go down to 0.5 on the scale for X and Y. We could even go a little bit lower. Let's go to 0.4. Yeah that looks good and then we'll put it yeah, right about there. All right? Whoops, I forgot to make that invisible. You could leave this visible and then in your game script actually on this on ready along with the randomize is just do uh, game over label dot visible equals false. So that'll hide it <clears throat> when the game starts. Um, yeah, so when I game over now I see the R to restart and I know that that's a feature of the game. Awesome. So by default, uh, escape button doesn't e exit a game. You have to hit uh, Control Alt F4 or whatever to kind of like force close a game. So let's go ahead and fix that really quick. Might as well. Um, if input dot is key key pressed, and we'll do uh, key escape. Then um, we'll close the game. I can't remember how to do this off the there it is, exit game. 
love my little cheat sheet and there we go so now when I play in and I'm like oh I'm done with this I just hit the escape key and my game closes that's a little bit more of what people would ex expect from a game um, you could pull up the menu and then have a, a menu exit but yeah alright I hope this game was fun it was fun to put together and uh, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something and uh, yeah have a good time bye